Grace and peace, everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. This is the final part of our five-part series. We've been looking at uh, going from arrogance to destruction, the end of Babylon. And Babylon ends in a drunken feast, in a drunken stupor. Somebody who's, who's so lit, as we like to say in the world, that um, they can't really see anything. There is no light. So we're going to talk about that today as we close. And Father, we do pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to our heart in a powerful way. Amen. Belshazzar's feast ends up being Belshazzar's fall. And we're warned about this in scripture, that how pride goeth before fall. And by not learning of the lesson uh, sent by his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, and in others, Belshazzar makes a terrible mistake. And what I want to learn from him, as we've already talked about the need to come out of Babylon, the, the poison, um, the asp that bites us in that Babylonian mindset, that worldly mindset, is actually identified in scripture as a type of drunkenness. There's an inebriation where we don't function right and we don't do or believe things that make sense. And it reminds us that we don't want to dream drunk. Don't dream drunk. Any more than you want to live drunk, don't dream drunk. In other words, don't get in your mind into a mindset like Belshazzar has. Uh, when he was drunk with the world, that he became inebriated, numb to the fact that there was a God who was watching what he was doing. Because the Bible calls this state, or the Bible calls this mind a reprobate mind. It is a mind that does not recognize the value of good. So there is no evil. I hope you caught that. By not recognizing the value or the validity or the truth of good, evil then fills this vacuum and evil then actually becomes what is right, the reprobate mind. And Paul warns us of it. And here Belshazzar is showing us the, the, the danger of this kind of mindset. See, in verse one, it says, Belshazzar, the king made a feast, a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. That just in and of itself wasn't a good political move as a leader to get in front of a group of people that you're leading. That's like the president getting in front of Congress in the United States and just getting drunk. The, the, the danger that you put yourself into, uh, and even back in those days and even today, um, to the threat of being taken advantage of or even taken out because you're no longer thinking clearly. But this is what wine does. It makes by taking away good and making it what I want it to be, then there is no wrong. Because now in verse two, it says Belshazzar goes on while he tasted the wine. He commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. So now Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, Belshazzar trades in the, um, the red plastic cups for now the golden vessels of Israel. And he drinks wine from them with his wives, plural, and his concubines, more plural, and everybody else. This was the highest insult. And had the Lord, I believe, not checked what had happened that night in this, in this way, we would have seen Babylon go to an even greater depth than just falling. And so the Lord says, enough is enough. And Babylon falls, but it falls in a stumble. It falls in a drunken stupor, too drunk that it can't walk straight. And it falls at the feet of Darius the Mede because of what it says here in verse four, all because they drink wine and praise the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. They praised things more than the one who gave them. Don't think this is some old school, archaic, ancient idea. We can praise things more than the one who gave them to us. Ever heard of a car? Car made of a little bit of silver, maybe some steel. Ever heard of a house? Oh, made of wood, with gold, with, the, with a, a stone on it. Ever heard of a person who takes the place of God and what he wants for us? And while they may not be made of gold, they're decked in it. And the words that they say, they're, they're as sweet or they're as precious to us as gold, even though those words are telling us to do all the wrong things. See, we've got to understand that the same temptation came from the tempter. And the tempter has not changed his strategy or approach. People say, well, why is it? 
because it works. The enemy knows our weaknesses. He knows the power of our pride and he knows how we've got this virus in us. And the only inoculation, the only freedom, the only healing is the grace of Jesus Christ, which takes us from that hubris to that humility, to stay in connection to the vine of grace, God's love. And the enemy uses all of these things. And guess what? They were the very things that were in the image from Daniel chapter two in their decreasing value all the way from the gold, all the way down even to this wood, this stubble that just tries to mix with this clay and iron. Now you see finally listed there at the party, the stone. The last thing that they praised was this God of stone. And that just those few verses, those few words, how he's literally prophesying his own end and how it will all end. The Bible says that at the very end of time that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And in Daniel chapter two, in the prophecy, Jesus is symbolized as the stone, the stone that strikes the image at its feet and brings it all to an end. And now comes this great mountain that establishes this new kingdom that Revelation tells us is the new heaven and the new earth that will come after the thousand years with God in heaven. All of this lets us know that what happened then is going to happen again. And here is the good news. How it ended then in a dramatic way and in the awesome way that it ended then, it's going to end and even greater so when Jesus comes. He is coming back, everybody. And he wants to come back for you. And you've got to remember, all I need to do for him to take me is do what Belshazzar does. To do what Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did. What did they do? <laughs> what did they do? <laughs> what did they do? What they did is what Jesus simply said we have to do. They believed. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were saved. Hey, if you enjoyed today's lesson in prophecy, be sure to visit our website, changeministry.org slash the highway home. Here you're going to find two visual studies that guide you through every prophetic event from now until the coming of Christ. And you'll even find a step by step study that goes deeper into the word of God so that you can find both the peace and the power that comes from the promise of Jesus's return.